Good day, students. I welcome you all to your favorite YouTube channel, Physics for Everybody. Today, we'll be solving May, June 2023, Physics 0625, Paper 2, Variant 3. And we'll go straight to the first question. Question number one. The speed time graph shows the motion of an object. How far does the object travel at constant speed? How far does the object travel at constant speed? How far is referring to the distance traveled? And how do you get the distance? Distance is equal to velocity or your speed times time. That's what gives you the distance. Usually we represent distance with capital letter S. And then, you know, the question refers to at constant speed. So there's a constraint that you want to consider the constant speed. Where do you have a constant speed? This is where we have a constant speed, okay? From, from where to where? from 5 seconds to 15 seconds time interval. This is the time interval we use, okay? And the constant speed is 5 meters per second. So the speed here is 5 meters per second, and the time here is this time duration, okay? What time duration do we have from 5 to 15? Just take the difference, 15 minus 5. So our speed is 5 meters per second, so I put 5 here in place of speed, multiply by, and the time, what is the time? The time is the difference, between 15 and 5. So I put 15 minus 5 here. So that will be 5 multiplied by 15 minus 5 gives us 10. And 5 multiplied by 10 is 50 meters. 50 meters. That is option B. So I'll select option B as the correct answer to question 1. We go straight to question number 2. Which statement about a falling object accelerating close to the Earth's surface is correct? A falling object accelerating close to the Earth's surface. Close to the Earth's surface, we know very well that the acceleration will be equal to the gravitational field strength of the Earth, which is 9.8 meters per second square. Okay, let's see. The weight of the object is increasing, and the force of air resistance on the object is decreasing. Weight of the object is not increasing because close to the Earth's surface, acceleration is equal to g, which is 9.8. So weight cannot be increasing. Weight can only be increasing when g is increasing. Okay, yeah. Um, then the weight of the object and the force of air resistance on the object are equal, are of equal magnitude, but act in opposite direction. Let's see. Which statement about a falling object accelerating? Since the object is accelerating, then the weight and the force of air resistance are not equal. For the weight and the force of air resistance to be equal, then the object must be moving at constant speed. It must be falling at constant velocity. That constant velocity is called terminal velocity, and it exists when the weight of the object is equal to the air resistance on the object. You see, option C, the weight of the object is constant. But the force of air resistance of the object is increasing. Weight of the object is constant. That makes sense because gravity is constant close to the Earth's surface. So if, they say, if we say the weight of the object is constant, that makes sense. Force of air resistance is increasing. That's also correct because the body is accelerating. Okay, if an object is accelerating as it falls towards the surface of the Earth, then it means the force of air resistance will also be increasing. The force of air resistance continues to increase until the force of air resistance is equal to the weight. Then the object starts falling at a constant speed, and that constant speed is called terminal velocity. So option C is the correct one, okay? Weight of the object is constant. That's because acceleration due to gravity is constant, okay? Then the force of air resistance on the object is increasing. Why? Because the object is accelerating, okay? Yeah, so you have to just understand that concept. Let's see option D, the weight of the object is less than force of air resistance. Weight of the object, no, of course not. If weight is acting downward and force of air resistance is acting upward, okay, air resistance, force due to air resistance. So if weight is less than force of air resistance, then it means the object will be going upward, which is not a realistic situation. It even, it even contradicts the question that says that the object is falling 
is accelerating close to the Earth's surface. The object is falling, yeah. So if the object is falling, then there's no reason why the upward force will be higher than the downward force. So the question number three, an aircraft is moving at 60 meters per second in a northerly direction. When a cross wind from the east starts to blow, the speed of the wind is 3 meters per second. What is the magnitude of the aircraft velocity when the wind is blowing? Let's um, consider this question. So we have to, we were given direction, okay, and we have velocity. Velocity is a vector quantity, so we have to resolve the vectors. An aircraft is moving at 60 meters per second in a northerly direction. So let's draw, draw the vector that represents the speed of the aircraft at 60 meters per second in a northerly direction. This is the direction of the north, this is the direction of the south, this is the direction of the east, this is the direction of the west. So what's next? We were told that um, a cross wind from the east starts to blow. So the wind is coming from the east. That means it's blowing towards the west. So we draw this vector to represent the wind. And the wind has a velocity of 13 meters per second. Okay, so let us erase all the values we don't need here. Now you are told that what is the magnitude of the aircraft's velocity when the wind is blowing? So you want to find the resultant of these two vectors. You know, these two vectors act at angle of 90 degrees to each other. Yeah, the angle here is 90 degrees, okay? And the velocity of the aircraft is to the north, and the wind is to the west. So what would be the resultant? You just draw a line joining these two together. This is the resultant. And how do you find the resultant? Pythagoras theorem. We call this side C, call this side A, call this side B. And according to the Pythagoras theorem, C is equal to square root of A square plus B square. Okay, the size of this right angle triangle represents the velocities of the plane, velocity of the airplane, and velocity of the wind. So we take square root of velocity of the wind is um, 13 meters per second. So we have 13 square plus velocity of the airplane is 60 meters per second. That's B here. Okay, this 60 meters per second represents velocity of the airplane. So we have 60 square. Okay, that will be square root of 13 times 13 is 169. Yes, 13 times 13 is 169 plus 60 times 60 is 3,600. So we have the square root of 3,600 plus 169. That will be 3,769. So now we take the square root of 3,769. Okay, let me try to bring that up here. Square root of SQRT 3,000. 769. I hope it works. No? SQ, X, SQ, RT. SQ, RT of 3,000. Uh -huh. Square root of 3,769. Okay, let me get this done another way. Okay, so I'll just press square root of 3,769. 3769. Okay, that should be 61.39. 61.39. I'm sure that's what this means. 61.39. So 61.39. Yeah, this is okay. So we have 61.39 meters per second. All the values given to us are given to the nearest whole number. So Take this to the nearest whole number, that will be 69. That means the correct answer to question three is option C. We go straight to question number four. Let's go straight to question number four. So, question number four. Two rectangular blocks consist of different materials. Four different methods are suggested to compare the two masses. Compare the accelerations with which they, they fall freely. Compare the values of their length times breadth times height. Hang each in turn from the same spring. Compare the extensions. Place one in the right hand pan of a beam balance and the other in the left hand pan. 
which method give a comparison of the two masses. Take note that we are focusing on masses here. Now, compare the acceleration with which they fall. No, this will not work because every object falls as, a, as an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second square. Okay, so irrespective of the mass, they will accelerate at 9.8 meters per second square. So comparing the acceleration will not work. Comparing the values of the length times breadth times height, this formula gives you the volume, okay? So this has nothing to do with the mass. Hang each in turn from a, from a spring, from, a, from the same spring, compare their extension. Of course, that's the lie with Hooke's law that says um, the extension produced is proportional to the force. I know that force is equal to mass times gravity. So the, the more massive objects will produce a large extension, okay? Yeah, the, most ma the more massive objects will produce a large extension, okay? Because the greater the mass, the greater the force produced. And when force is large, extension will be large. So this uh, number three will work. What about the last one? Place one in the right-hand pan of a beam balance and the other in the left-hand pan. That is also gonna work. If you have a beam balance and we have a, a pivot here, so we place one on the left-hand pan and we place the other on the right-hand pan. This is a very good method to compare two masses. So number four will also work. That makes option C the correct answer to question number four. We go straight to question number five. An object in a space probe above the Earth weighs three newton. Gravitational field strength at the height of the space probe is 7.0 newton per kilogram. The gravitational field strength on the Earth's surface is 9.8 newton per kilogram. What is the mass and the weight of the object on the Earth's surface? Okay, we know very well that um, weight is equal to mass times gravity, and the weight is the force, okay, that the object experiences. Okay, now let's look at this. An object in a space probe above the Earth weighs 3.5 Newton. So, above the Earth, the weight of the object was 3.5 Newton. What's the mass? We do not know it. But what's the, what's the gravitational field strength at at that point above the Earth? At that point above the Earth, at, uh, on, on the space probe, gravitational field strength was 7.0 Newton per kilogram. Okay, so you put 7.0 here. So 3.5 is equal to mass times 7.0. How do you get the mass? Divide both sides by, by 7.0. Divide by 7.0. That simply means the mass of the object is 0 0.5 kilogram. Okay, yeah, the question says, what is the mass and the weight of the object? How do you get the weight of the object on the Earth's surface now? You know, we, we were focusing on, on the space probe, okay? On the space probe, this was the weight and this was the force, okay? We have, a, we have the Earth, okay? Then we have a space probe, that's a satellite, okay? So on the satellite, the gravitational field strength was seven Newton per kilogram, okay? Yeah, and then, um, we had the weight on the space probe as seven Newton. But on the surface of the Earth now, here, gravitational field strength on the surface of the Earth is 10, 9.8, not 10, is 9.8 meters, 9.8 um, meter per second square or Newton per kilogram. So I'll put that here. Gravitational field strength on the surface of the Earth is 9.8, okay? What will be the weight? We do not know. How do you find that weight? Weight, is equal to mass times gravity. We know the mass of the object does not change. It's 0 0.5, right? So the mass is 0 0.5. What's gravitational field strength on the surface of the Earth? 9.8. So we, have, we multiply 0 0.5 by 9.8. That will give us 4.9 Newton. That's the weight of the object on the surface of the Earth, 4.9 Newton. And the mass of the object does not change. It's 0 0.5 kilogram. So that's option B. Option B gives us a mass of 0 0.5 newton, 0 0.5 kilogram and a weight of 4.9 newton. We go straight to question number six. I hope you understand this. Please, if you don't understand any concept, you can watch that part of this video again. A cyclist is traveling in a straight line along a horizontal road at a constant speed. A constant driving force F acts on the cyclist in a forward direction. Which statement about the magnitude of the frictional force acting on the cyclist is correct? The magnitude is equal to F. A cyclist traveling in a straight line along a horizontal road at a constant speed. If the speed is constant, 
If speed is constant, let me use V to represent speed. If speed is constant, that means acceleration is equal to zero. That means there is no acceleration. For acceleration to be zero, it simply means the resultant force is zero. Why? Why did I say the resultant force is zero? Because force is mass times acceleration, okay? Yes, so if acceleration is zero, constant speed means acceleration is zero. And acceleration being zero automatically means the force, the resultant force on this surface is zero. And for the resultant force on this surface to be zero, it simply means this forward force that is provided by the proportion by pedaling these tires, by pedaling this, um, by working on the pedal, this forward propulsive force, okay, yes, that's the propulsive force, proportion. This forward propulsive force must be equal to the friction. Yes, that's what that's the only condition for the resultant force to be zero. When the forward force is equal to the friction. Okay, yeah. So the magnitude, so which statement about the frictional force on the cyclist is correct. The magnitude is equal to F, option A. That is the correct answer. Yeah, yeah. So the resultant force, force resultant, is equal to the propulsive force minus friction. So when they are equal, the resultant force will be zero Newton. And that makes sense. Resultant force is zero Newton. That's why acceleration is zero, okay? Acceleration is zero because speed is constant. You know, the question told us it's starting at a constant speed. Physics is very interesting. Let's go to question number seven. A spring has an unstretched length of 3.0 centimeters. Unstretched length is 3.0 centimeters. When a force of 60 Newton is applied to the spring, its length increases to 5.0 centimeters. So the length increases to 5.0 centimeters. The limit of proportionality is not exceeded. What is the spring constant of the spring? Spring constant K equals to F over E, the force divided by extension. The force, do not forget that the extension is difference in length, L1 minus L0, okay? Yeah. So, what is the force applied? The force applied is 60 Newton. What is the difference in length? L1 is 5, L sub 0 is 3. That will be 60 divided by 2. That gives me 30 Newton per centimeter. That means option D, the correct answer to question number 7. We go straight to question number 8. The diagram shows the minimum force F1 acting vertically on a lever required to lift a heavy log of wood. A heavy log of weight W. This is a heavy log. The log needs to be lifted by a smaller force. The force here, sorry, the force here must be smaller than the weight of the object, okay? Than the weight of this um, log. The diagrams show the changes tried. Each diagram has only one change from the original diagram. In each case, F2 is the minimum force. F2, okay, the minimum force required to lift the log. Now the question, in which situation will F2 be smaller than F1? So in which situation will the normal, the minimum, be the minimum force, okay, the minimum force required to lift the log. In which situation will it be smaller than this force here? Okay, so what changes do we apply to ensure the force we need to apply will be very small? Number one, increasing the length of the lever to the right. If you increase this length, then it will increase this distance here, D2. Do not forget that um, total clockwise moment, total clockwise moment, must be equal to the total anti-clockwise moment. What's producing the clockwise moment? F1 multiplied by D, okay? Let me call this distance D1. So F1, D1, that's producing the clockwise moment. What's producing anti-clockwise moment? Let's call this distance here D2, okay? And this weight here is W. W times D2, that is producing the anti-clockwise moment. So what changes would you make to ensure the the 
to ensure a less force is, 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 is um, used. To use a less force here, do we increase the distance here? No. Increasing the distance here would, would help increase the... Yeah, increasing the distance here would help us to... Uh, no, increasing this distance on the right here would help us ensure that um, the clockwise moment is higher. Yeah, to increase the clockwise moment, we increase this distance that causes the, the clockwise force, okay? So if you are increasing... If you are increasing the length of the pivots to the right, that will help, okay? This will help. Applying a force perpendicular to the lever, this will also help. Q will also help, okay? Yeah, because moment, moment equals to force multiplied by perpendicular distance. Do not forget that this force is not perpendicular to this length here. So making this force perpendicular to this length would go a long way in increasing the moment, okay? So this will also help, okay? T is a good um, step to take. Q is also a good step to take. Let's see what you have on R. Increasing the distance from the log to the pivot. If we increase this distance D2, we are increasing the anticlockwise moment. And increasing the anticlockwise moment will make it more difficult for you to lift the log here, okay? You should be trying to increase the clockwise moment. Yeah, when you increase the clockwise moment, then then um, it ensures that when you increase the clockwise moment, you know, the clockwise moment is the force multiplied by distance, okay? So to increase the clockwise moment, you have to increase the distance on the right, okay? The distance producing the clockwise moment, or you increase the force. And a very good way to increase the force, okay? In a, a very good way to increase the force that produces the clockwise moment is by making that force perpendicular. That way you don't have to apply much force. Okay, by making sure the force is perpendicular to the pivot. So option B is the only correct answer because that's P and Q. This R will not work, okay? But P and Q will work. Increasing the distance, making the force perpendicular to the to the to the length of the of the lever, okay? Making the force perpendicular to the pivot, to the lever. So number nine, a ball of mass 0 0.25 kilogram hits a wall at a speed of 60 meters per second. It rebounds back along its original path at a speed of 12 meters per second. What is the impulse experienced by the ball during its impact with the wall? What's the formula for impulse? Impulse equals to force times time. Do not forget that impulse is also the same thing as change in momentum. And momentum is mass multiplied by change in velocity. So we have the mass, we have the change in velocity. This is the formula we're using to calculate the impulse. So impulse equals to mass multiplied by change in velocity, and change in velocity will be initial velocity minus final velocity. Why? Because the initial velocity is higher than final velocity. What's the mass? The mass is 0 0.25 kilogram. Initial velocity is 60 meters per second. Final velocity is 12 meters per second. If you multiply 0 0.25 by 4, 60 minus 12 is 4. If you multiply 0 0.25 by 4, you get 1 newton second. That's the impulse. That makes option. Hold on, hold on. This is 60 meters per second, 0 0.25 kilogram. Hold on. Okay, I'm going to take this again because this is not going to work. Impulse equals to mass times change in velocity. And the change in velocity is final velocity minus initial velocity. Okay, so if you multiply change in velocity by the mass, this is what we are supposed to do, okay? So I shouldn't be doing initial velocity minus final velocity. Change in velocity is final velocity minus initial velocity. I wasn't supposed to switch it, okay? By switching it, then I missed the concept completely. Now, let us have a visual representation of what happened here. We had a wall. We had a wall moving towards the wall at a speed of 16 meters per second. And after hitting the wall, it bounced back at a speed of 12 meters per second. This is what you want to use to solve this question, okay? So, and the formula we are using is impulse equals to mass multiplied by final velocity minus initial velocity. What's the mass? The mass is 0 0.25 kilogram. What's final velocity? The final velocity is um, 12, okay? Final velocity is 12 meters per second. 12 minus what's the initial velocity? Initial velocity is 16. 
and the direction of the initial velocity is opposite to the direction of final velocity. Final velocity and initial velocity are in opposite direction to each other. Velocity is a vector quantity, okay? So that simply means if the final velocity is 12 meters per second, it simply means the initial velocity is minus 16 meters per second because velocity is a vector quantity. And the direction being opposite simply means it is a negative velocity. So our initial velocity is minus 16. So we have to put our minus 16 meters per second here, okay? We don't need to put the SI unit. We close the bracket. So 12 minus minus 16, that's equal to 28. So we have 0 0.25 multiplied by 28. 0 0.25 multiplied by 28 will give us 7 newton seconds. That is the correct answer, not this. Number 10. A bicycle braking system transfers energy from a kinetic energy store to an internal energy store. Okay, that energy is being converted from kinetic energy to heat energy. That's internal energy. A motor converts energy from chemical energy store to kinetic energy store. Okay, so you are using a um, chemical energy stored in the battery through electrical flow of current. It will then be converted to kinetic energy in the motor. What enables this energy transfers? Number one, electrical work done in the brake. No, we don't need electrical energy in the brake. It's just mechanical, mechanical energy, okay, to heat energy. Electrical work done in the braking, no. Mechanical work done in braking system, yeah. So these two are correct for the braking system. Let's look at the motor in these two cases. Mechanical work done in the motor, no. It is electrical work done in the motor. This is the only one that is correct for the motor, okay. This one and this one, okay. These are the only ones that are correct for the motor. So where do you have the two options being correct? That's option D, okay? Yeah, because we have mechanical work done for the motor and electrical work done, sorry, mechanical work done for the brake, okay? Yeah, kinetic energy being converted to heat energy. That's mechanical work done for the brake and electrical work done for the motor, yeah, which is um, electrical energy coming from the battery. That makes option D the correct answer to this question. Number 11, the research is being carried out to produce electrical energy from the fusion of hydrogen nuclei. Which role shows two of the problems in designing a fusion reactor? Temperature. Temperature required must be very high. That's why the temperature of the sun is very high. Okay? That's why nuclear fusion can successfully take place in the sun. Because the temperature required for fusion must be very high temperature. Okay? Yeah, so these are correct. Let's come here and pick the correct ones from these two. The nuclei are negatively charged. No, the nuclei of hydrogen is positively charged. Okay? The nuclei is positively charged. In fact, the nucleus of hydrogen has only one proton. Yeah, only one proton. And then um, we have an electron. We have an electron. Yeah, that's the, um, this is an isotope of hydrogen, the one called protium. Protium. Then um, deuterium has a proton and a neutron. Okay. Deuterium has a proton and a neutron, okay, and then an electron. Yeah, so if you look at this, you see that um, even to form deuterium, it is through the fusion of two hydrogen atoms, okay? Through the fusion, fusion of two hydrogen atoms, that's how you have deuterium, okay? Yeah, that's how you have deuterium, and, um, and then we have a free, a free particle. Being produced as a byproduct. So the nucleus is positively charged. Okay, the nuclei are positively charged and repel each other. That is what that is the main reason why obtaining a very high density of hydrogen nuclei is very difficult. Okay, so obtaining a high density of hydrogen nuclei is difficult because the nuclei are positively charged and they repel each other. So in order to bring them close, it requires large energy to bring them close together. For the fusion to be successful. Okay, we go to question 12. The engine of a motor vehicle develops a large power. Which statement is correct? Well, to have um, power is equal to work done divided by time, okay, or you see energy divided by time. So if power is large, then it means a large amount of energy is being dissipated within a short period of time, okay, or a large work of done, a large amount of work is done within a short period of time. Let's see, the driving force acting on the vehicle must be large. 
No, we are not talking about for sale. The engine must de develop, must have a very large volume. No, not volume. It doesn't necessarily mean. The engine must transfer large amounts of energy each second. Yeah, energy per second, large amount of, of energy per unit second. That is correct, okay? Option D, the vehicle must be very fast. It doesn't necessarily matter. Number 13, the graph shows how the pressure due to a liquid varies with the depth beneath the liquid surface. The gravitational field strength G is 9.8 newton per kilogram. This pressure due to liquid, pressure in Pascal, Depth beneath the liquid surface, depth in meter. What is the density of the liquid? Uh, well, to get this done, this is a liquid, right? And the formula for pressure in liquid is density times gravity times height. So to get density in, in this in this case, where we make density the subject of this expression, so density is equal to pressure divided by gravity times height. Okay, or we say density is equal to pressure divided by height, multiplied by one over gravity. Yeah, pressure per unit height, multiplied by one over gravity. This expression will give you the pressure, okay? So the, this expression will give you the density. Yeah, the question says, what is the density of the liquid? This expression will give you the density. Pressure per unit height, multiplied by one over gravitational field strength. Do you have gravitational field strength? Yes, you have the gravitational field strength G as 9.8 Newton per kilogram. So this one here is 9.8 newton per kilogram. What about pressure per unit height? This is pressure in Pascal. This is depth, okay, or the height of the liquid, the depth of the liquid in meter. So if you find the, the pressure per unit height, this is the pressure per unit height. Multiply by one over G, we get the density of the liquid. Yeah, how do you get pressure per unit height? Find the slope of this straight line, okay? Yeah, dy, the x, changing what we have on the y axis divided by change we have in what we have on the x axis, okay? Yeah, the slope or the gradient, slope can be gotten using dy, dx, okay? Delta y, delta x, okay? Yeah, so pressure per unit height will be, let us just do a large triangle, a big right angle triangle, okay? So use this part as the, as the, we, are, we use this part of this graph to calculate the slope. So what do you have as change in y axis? We have 4,000 minus zero. Sorry, two, we have 4,000 minus zero, 4,000 minus zero, divided by, what do you have on the x axis? We have 0 0.5 minus zero, 0 0.5 minus zero. That will be 4,000 divided by 0 0.5. So pressure per unit height is equal to 8,000, 8,000, yeah, 8,000. So, pressure per unit height is 8,000. So, you multiply our 8,000 by 1 over 9.8. Okay? So, 8,000 multiplied by 1 over 9.8, that is the same thing as saying 8,000 divided by 9.8. So, let's get that done with our calculator. 8,000 divided by 9.8. 9.8. Let's see what you have there. 816,000. Sorry. 816.32. 816.32. 816.32. So you have 816.32. So you write that to two significant figures, okay? Yeah, because um, the values we have are written. Gravity is written to two sigram figures, okay? Yeah, okay, so all these values too, they are written to two sigram figures. 0 0.80, two sigram figures. Let's write this to two sigram figures. Writing this to two significant figures, it should be 820 Newton per meter cube. Yeah, pressure is measured in Newton per meter cube. That makes option B the correct answer to question number 13. We go straight to question number 14. What is the lowest possible temperature, absolute zero? And what happens to energy of particle at that temperature? Lowest possible temperature is zero Kelvin, okay? And in degrees Celsius, that will be minus 273 degrees Celsius. What happens to energy of particles? Particle energy. Particles have least kinetic energy. Option A is the correct answer. You don't need to look at the rest, okay? Absolute zero has nothing to do with gravitational potential energy. 
Pascal have least kinetic energy, that's correct, but it's not zero degrees Celsius. Let's go to question number 15. Which statement about the particles of a substance after condensation is correct? After condensation, they are close to each other, correct, and slide over each other. That's correct. That's condensation. Okay. Conversion from the gaseous state to liquid state. The particles become closer. Okay. In gases, the particles are a bit far apart. Okay. But when condensation takes place, it turns to a liquid and the particles become very close together. Okay. Yeah. So that is condensation and the particles can slide over each other. Of course, they can slide over each other in the liquid state. But in the solid state, the particle can only vibrate about a fixed position. Question number 16. Two otherwise identical cars, one black and one white, are at the same initial temperature. The cars are left in bright sunlight and their temperatures increase. During the night, their temperatures decrease. Which car shows greater rate of temperature increase? And which car shows greater rate of temperature decrease? Greater rate of temperature increase. Black. Greater rate of temperature decrease. Black. That's correct. Yeah. Black surfaces absorb almost all the incident radiant heat energy. So all heat reaching the car by radiation will be absorbed by the black surface. So black will show the highest temperature increase. What about greatest temperature decrease? It's also black because black surfaces are very good at radiating heat energy. Okay. So when the surface is made black, this is the best absorber of um, radiant heat energy. And it's also the best transmitter of radiant heat energy. So the black surface will transmit all its heat energy in the night. Okay, it will transmit it and its temperature will drop quickly because it has lost all its energy through radiation. Number 17, a drop of water from a tap falls onto the surface of some water of constant depth. Water will spread out on the surface of the water. Which statement is correct? A. The waves are longitudinal waves. No, 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 no. Sound waves and um, and the primary waves produced during the earthquake. Those are the longitudinal waves, okay? Okay? The waves are longitudinal waves. No. The waves are transverse waves, good, and travel at the same speed in all direction. That is correct. Even looking at the diagram, you can see they are traveling at the same speed in all direction. The waves are transverse and travel more quickly in one direction than in in others. No, no. Option C is the correct answer to question number 17. Number 18. Each point F is one focal length from the center of the lens. Each point 2F is two focal length from the center of the lens. Which diagram shows a convergent lens used as a magnifying lens? This is the object. This is the image. You see the image is smaller than the object. The image is diminished. So here it's not acting as a magnifying lens. Okay. Yeah. Is not magnifying, it's not producing an enlarged magnifying lens means it's producing an enlarged image. Here, this is the object, this is the image. Of course, the image is bigger, but the image is a is a real image because it's can it is captured on the screen. Okay, magnifying lens, the image cannot be captured on the screen. Okay, so this is not magnified. This is magnified, fine, but it's not working as a magnifying lens because the image can be captured on the screen. You can see the lines representing rays of light. The rays of light converge at this point, okay? So we have a real principal focus here. So it's not working as a magnifying lens here. In this case, this is the object. The image is formed at infinity. So the image is not being captured on any screen, okay? So it's not working as a magnifying lens here. In this case, this is the object, okay? The rays of light come this way and go towards the eyes, okay? The rays of, of light coming from the top of the object pass through the optical center and continue to go. So if you view it from here, you see a virtual image here, a virtual image that is upright. And you can see these dotted lines here show that the rays of light do not actually meet here, okay? But the rays of light coming to the light, to the eyes, they appear as if they were coming from here. So this makes it a virtual image. It cannot be captured on the screen. And that is how the magnifying lens works. Images formed by the magnifying lens cannot be captured on the screen, okay? And this can be 
can be illustrated with this felt simulation, okay? This is the object, this is the image. When the object was far away, the image was very small. Let me remove the meter out so you can see it clearly. See, the image is small. As you are bringing the objects closer, the image is getting bigger. The image is getting bigger. Once the object gets closer than twice the principal focus, okay? The focal length of this lens is 50 centimeters, okay? So if I place my meter here, 100 centimeters as the optical center, that simply means the principal focus will be minus 50 centimeters. So I'm bringing the, these objects at this point here, okay? That simply means if the object is at 2F, the image will also be at 2F. The distance from here to here is 50 centimeters, okay? Here to here is 50 centimeters. Here to here is another 50 centimeters. Here to here is another 50 centimeters, total of 200. So if the object is at twice the focal, principal, the focal length, the image will also be at twice the focal length. If the object is closer than that, then we start having the magnified image. But if the object is farther than 2F, the image will be diminished, it will be smaller. Okay, so once the object gets to 2F, the image will be an exact replica of the object, okay? But it will, it will be inverted. If I bring the image clo object closer, the image becomes magnified. Once I bring the object at F, we have image formed at infinity, and it will be a virtual image. That's why we have dotted lines there. Take note that here, we add thick lines, real lines. This image can be captured on the screen. It's a real image. Once I bring it closer, then I have a virtual image. It cannot be captured on the screen. Once I come closer than that, then you have this virtual image here. Okay? Magnified. And it is upright. It's not inverted. It's upright. This is what the magnifying lens do. Okay? So you bring your eyes here to come and view it. The lens will be here. Then the object will be here. If you bring your eyes here, you will see a very big image with your eyes. But if you put a screen here, this image cannot be captured on the screen. That's why we represent it with dotted lines, okay? That's why we have dotted lines here, okay? So this explains the situation we have on ground. That makes option D the only correct answer because that is when we have the lens acting as a magnifying lens. We go straight to question number 20. A narrow beam of white light passes through a prism and is dispersed into a spectrum. Which row is correct? Okay, yeah, of course, you know, <coughs> the colors of um, the rainbow, right? Beef, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And that is the order we have here, okay? The first one will be red, the last one will be violet, okay? Yeah, and this, this in the middle, we have all these other colors. So let's see, number one is blue, of course not possible. Number one, blue, number one, red, yes. The next one should be blue. Should the rest of the next one be blue? If the next one is blue, then the last one must be indigo or violet. But we have yellow here. This one will not work. First one, red. That's correct. Second one, yellow. Red, yellow. Yes. We have red. We have yellow. The next one is blue. Red before yellow before blue. That makes option C the only correct answer. The first color definitely can be yellow. If the first one is yellow, then the next one should be maybe blue and the last one violet. First one, yellow, blue. Yellow before blue. Okay, let's see the next one. The last one is red. No, we can't have yellow, blue, then red. That's not possible. So that makes option C the only correct answer to question number 20. We go straight to question number 21. A student writes four statements matching a communication system to the region of the electromagnetic spectrum that it uses to transmit signals. Which statement is correct? Wireless internet uses visible light, visible wavelength. No, wireless internet is using microwaves. Mobile phones use X-rays. No, mobile phones use microwaves. Cable television uses infrared. How do you switch on your television using the remote control? Your remote control uses infrared, okay? Yeah, your remote control of your television uses infrared rays. So that is correct. Bluetooth uses ultraviolet. No, it is using um, radio wave and microwave. Number 22. A ship sounds its horn at a 
Sorry, a ship sound its horn when it is sounded at 90 meters from a cliff. A passenger on the ship hears the echo 4.8 seconds later. What is the speed of sound? Well, speed of sound, speed of sound is distance divided by time, right? But do not forget that here we have a ship in front of a cliff. So the sound travels to the cliff and travels back to the to the ship, right? A passenger on the ship hears the echo. Uh -huh. So whenever you have that simply means we are having echo here. The sound goes and returns, okay? So the total distance traveled will be twice the distance between the ship and the cliff because sound wave goes to the cliff and back to the ship, okay? So the total distance traveled by the sound will be two times the distance between the ship and the cliff, okay? Yeah, so the formula for the speed will now be 2D divided by T, okay? Yeah, the distance is 790 meters, so we have 2 times 790 divided by what's the time taken? 4.8, 4.8. So let's perform this calculation, 2 times 790 divided by 4.8. So when you perform this calculation, you get 329.16, okay? When you multiply 2 times 790 divided by 4.8, you get 329.16. Writing to two significant figures, that will be 330 meters per second. Why are we writing to two significant figures? Because all our values were given to two significant figures. So our answer should also be expressed in two significant figures. So, option B is the correct answer to question 22. We go straight to question 23. Which row gives the metal used to make the core of an electromagnet and one property of the electromagnet? Iron. Yes, we use iron to make electromagnet, okay? Yeah, because it's a soft ferromagnetic material. That means it can easily be, become, be turned to a magnet, a temporary magnet, actually. So, it's iron, and iron forms temporary magnet yeah an electromagnet is a temporary magnet okay so that makes option b the correct answer to question 23. we move straight to question 24. a plastic rod and a dry cloth are uncharged the rod is now rubbed with the cloth and and they are both and they both become charged the rod becomes negatively charged because some charged particles move from the cloth to the rod that's correct which charge what is the charge on the cloth the only charge that can move a negative charge, the electron, okay? Because the structure of an atom um, ensures that proton and neutron are in the nucleus and the electrons are at the shells, okay? So it's only electrons that can move, okay? So the only charge that move are the electrons. I know the electrons are negatively charged. So the only charge that move are negatively charged, okay? Particles that move, of course, particles that move are the electrons. That makes option A the correct answer to, hold on. What is the charge on the clothes? Hold on, hold on. The particles that are moved are the electrons, okay? Particles that are moved are the electrons. Then charge on the clothes now. What is the charge on the clothes? This place says, um, the rod becomes negatively charged. So if we have a rod and a cloth, and at the end, the rod is having a negative, negative charge, Automatically means there is a resultant positive charge on the clothes. So the charge on the clothes will be a positive charge. Okay? Yeah. So the charge on the clothes must be positive and the, the particle that move are the electrons. So where do we have the two being correct? It's only option C, okay, that shows that charge on the clothes is positive, then the electrons are the particles that move. So that makes option C the only correct answer to question number 24. It goes straight to question number 25. A student does an experiment to investigate the resistance of a metal wire. The graph shows the results of the experiment. This experiment to investigate the resistance of a metal wire. Do not forget that resistivity of a material is Ra over L. And that simply means resistance is Rho L over A. Okay, so from this formula, we can see that resistance is directly proportional to the length of the conductor, and resistance is inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area. Yeah, and how do you get area? Area is equal to pi d square. So area, 
area is proportional to diameter. So here you can see that resistance is proportional to one over square of diameter. Yeah, because area is pi d square. So resistance is inversely proportional to the square of diameter. And resistance is directly proportional, resistance is directly proportional to length. So the graph shows the result of the experiment. What is plotted on the x-axis? On the y-axis, we have resistance, okay? If what we had on the x-axis is the length, then we have a straight line graph this way, showing us that resistance is directly proportional to length, okay? But since we have inverse proportionality, our graph could have been like this, resistance, cross-sectional area, inverse proportionality. This is a graph that represents inverse proportionality, okay? Okay, so resistance and cross-sectional area. But since the graph is a curve graph, that shows that we have um, an exponential function here, okay? Okay, that means there is an exponential relationship here. Exponential inverse proportionality, okay? Yeah, exponential inverse proportionality. That simply means what we have here is the diameter, okay? What we have on the on the horizontal on the horizontal axis must be the diameter, okay? Okay. Yeah, that means what we have on the horizontal axis will be the diameter. That's why you have it this way. I hope this is clear. Of course, this is clear. That's why you have this curve line. Because yeah, there's a direct relationship between resistance and cross-sectional area, okay? But as for the square of the distance, as for the square of the distance then that's what creates this exponential curve. So what we have here, that makes option A the correct answer to question 25. Let's go to question number 26. The cost of electrical energy is $0.25 for each unit, for each unit of one kilowatt hour. Yeah, so $0.25 for each kilowatt hour. A 200 watt heater is switched on for 48 minutes. What is the cost? Of this use, um, you know, cost is equal to the rate at which power is being consumed multiplied by the energy consumed. Yeah, that's how um, the power um, power holding company charges it her customers. And what is the energy? Energy is equal to power times time. And do not forget that the rate is in kilowatt hour. So your power must be expressed in kilowatts. Your time must be expressed in hours. What's the power here? The power here is um, 2,200 watts. 2,200 watts, let us express it in kilowatts. You divide by 1,000 to express in kilowatts, okay? That's for the power, okay? Power is 2,200 watts, express in kilowatts, we divide it by 1,000. What about the time? Time is 48 minutes. Let's express minutes in hour. What we, what we do, we divide by 60. In order to express time in hour, divide by 60. So now let's solve this expression, 2,200 times 48 divided by 60,000. 2,200 times 48 divided by 60 times 1,000, that's 60,000. That gives us 1.76. So that means the energy is 1.76 kilowatt hour. Now, we will now come and put the energy here. Cost is the rate at which power is being charged times energy consumed, okay? So cost is the rate, the rate is 0 0.25 dollars per kilowatt hour. So this is the rate, 0 0.25. Multiplied by the energy consumed, energy consumed is 1.76. 0 0.25 multiplied by 1.76 let us multiply this answer by 0 0.5. That will give us 0 0.44. 0 0.44 dollars. And that's the correct answer. 0 0.44 dollars. That makes option A the correct answer to question 25. Question 26. The table describes four different resistance wires. They are all made from the same metal. Which wire has the smallest resistance? Resistance is equal to resistivity length divided by area. So for the resistance to be small, for the resistance to be small, then length 
must be small, area must be big. Yeah, because resistance is there, it's proportional to length. So if you want resistance to be small, length must be small. Resistance is inversely proportional to area. So if you want resistance to be small, area must be big. But we don't have area, we have diameter. This also means diameter must be big because area is pi d squared. Okay, there is a direct relationship between area and diameter. So when diameter is big, area is big. So you want diameter to be big and you want length to be small. Okay, that's what we make resistance to be small. Yeah, which wire has the smallest resistance? So where do you have the smallest length? Okay, we have small length here. Where do you have big area? Big area, we have big area here, we have big area here. That makes option B the correct answer because that's where we have small length and big and bigger area. We go straight to question number 28. The circuit shown contains three switches and four lamps, P, Q, R, and S. Lamp P, Q, R, and S. Which switches must be closed? So light only lamps P and R. We want only P and R to come on. Okay, how will you do that? It means you want current to flow only this way, and you also want current to flow this way. Yeah. How would that be successful? That means this one must be open, so that current will not flow here. This one must be open, so that current will not flow here. For current to flow here, this one must be closed, so you have to close switch one. Let me color blue for that. You have to close switch one. Which other switch do you have to close? None. Only switch one, that's all. The rest of them can remain open. Okay. A, switch one only. That's the correct answer to question 28. A is the correct answer to question 28. You go to question 29. The diagram shows the magnetic field around a solenoid carrying an electric current. What happens to the strength of the magnetic field and the distance between the field lines when the current is increased? When we increase the current, magnetic field strength will increase. Yeah. Yeah, because um, magnetic, the force is equal to BIL. This is not part of your syllabus, but to increase the force, we have to, what happens, what happens to the strength of the magnetic field when the distance between, sorry, what happens to the strength of the magnetic field when the distance between the field lines and the current is increased. Okay, yeah, to increase the, the strength of the magnetic field will definitely increase, okay? The strength of the magnetic field would increase, yes, yes. When you increase the current, what happens to the strength of the magnetic field? When the distance between the field lines, what happens to the strength of the magnetic field and the distance between the field lines when the current is increased? When you increase the current, Magnetic field will definitely increase, the strength will increase, and as the strength is increased, then it also, it's auto, automatically means the distance between the field lines will decrease. Why? Because we have more lines of force, okay? We have more lines of force. The stronger the magnetic field, the more the lines of force that we present here, okay? And if the magnetic field line is very weak, if the magnetic field is weak, then we have very few lines of force, okay? We have very few lines of force. Yeah, when the magnetic field strength is weak, then we have fewer lines of force. Okay. For instance, this one might not be there. When the magnetic, when the yeah, when the current is, is low, this one might not be there. Okay, we have very few lines of force. And that simply means the distance between the lines of force will be much. Okay. But when the magnetic field, when the magnetic field is strong. That's when the current is much, then magnetic field strength will be small. Magnetic field strength, when the current is much, magnetic field strength will be high, and the distance between the lines of force will be very small. Okay? Yeah, so that makes, um, that makes C the correct answer. Okay? When you increase the current, magnetic field strength will increase, then distance between field strength will decrease. It will be very, very small. And you can even see it at the poles, where the strength of the magnetic field is concentrated. The distance between the field lines is small. Okay, that shows that here the strength of the magnetic field is high and here the strength of the magnetic field is weaker. That's why the lines of force are spaced apart. Question number 30. 
The diagram shows a wire hanging freely between the poles of a magnet. There's a current in the wire in the direction shown. Current goes in this direction. Magnetic lines of force go from north pole to south pole. So magnetic lines of force are moving in this direction. The direction of the current causes a force to act on the wire. There's a force on this wire. In which direction does, the, does this force act? Okay. Um, since we have current, since we have current going into the system and the output is producing a force, that is a motor, and that is how the propeller works. And for it to solve questions on evolving the motor, we use Fleming's left hand rule. Okay. Yeah, if you were the one producing a force or you are producing motion and the force is directed at the system and the system generates current or it produces an induced EMF, that will be a generator. And if you are working on the general, gener that will be a generator. And if you are working on the generator, we use Fleming's right hand rule. Okay, good. So Fleming's left hand rule is for the motor, right hand rule is for the generator. Okay, just if you are writing the alphabet, I, J, K, L, M, L before M. So the left hand rule is for the motor. Okay, that's a good way to memorize it. Left hand rule is for the motor and the right hand rule is for the generator. Now let us focus on the left hand rule, which is for this motor here. What is the question telling us? You have to find the direction of the force. You know, to solve the question on the left hand rule, you have to arrange the three, these three fingers perpendicular to each other, okay? The index finger represents the direction of the field. The longest finger represents the current flowing in the conductor, while the thumb represents the force, the motion produced, okay? So those three fingers must be arranged perpendicular to each other. When you do this successfully, now arrange this such that the, the index finger points in the direction of the field. The field is pointing from north to south, okay, in this direction. Yeah, the field is pointing in this direction. What about the, the current? Current is flowing downwards, so ensure current flows downwards, okay. So when you do that successfully, the field is pointing to the left, current pointing downwards. What will be the direction of the thumb? The direction of the thumb points inside the paper. The thumb points inside the paper. Okay? Is that what we have? Is that what we have? Let me, let me analyze this again. Yeah. This index finger represent the direction of the field lines, okay? So the field lines is pointing which way? It's pointing this way, okay? And that's what you can see from the diagram. The field line is pointing this way, okay? Yeah? Okay, the position of my finger is not pointing in the way. This, uh, my camera does lateral inversion. Let me try this here. Uh-huh, so the the direction of the index finger will point in the direction of the of the magnetic field. Okay, yeah, magnetic field lines of force go from from north pole to the south pole. Okay, so you arrange your finger such that the index finger points in the direction of the current. Then the mid finger points in the direction of the index finger points in the direction of the field. Okay, this direction, this direction of the field. Okay, from north to south, okay. So, and the index finger must point in that direction. Then, the middle finger pointing downwards in the direction of the current, okay. And see current is pointing downward. Your thumb will end up pointing inside the page of this book, okay. Yeah, and that is what the direction of the force will be, okay. So, question 30, we have A, showing that um, the thumb will point into the page, okay, and away from you. So that's what we have here. And that is from Fleming's left hand rule. I hope this is understood. Please, this must be understood. We go straight to the next question, question number 31. Question 31. Which component forms part of a DC motor, but not a simple moving coil AC generator? In a DC motor, we have slip rings. 
In a DC motor, we have slip rings. But in an AC motor or AC generator, we don't have slip rings. So we have the commutator, we have slip rings. So the conductor, the external circuit is connected to the commutator, okay? DC motor, so we have the power supply here, okay? Positive terminal, negative terminal. So in here, then we have the coil. Yeah, so that is it. And this one goes here. So this is exactly what we have in the DC motor, okay? So we need slip point. We need them um, split rings, okay? We need split rings. Then there will be space between them. So split ring commutator, that's what we have in the DC motor. And it is absent completely in an AC system, be it an AC motor or an AC generator. Split ring is not applied, is not um, being used in AC motor and AC generator. Split rings are used in DC motor and DC generators. A transformer has 5,500 tons on the primary coil and 500 tons on the secondary coil. The output of the secondary coil is 110 volt AC and is connected to a heater. The transformer is 100% efficient. The AC, sorry, the heater produces a power of 132 watts. What is the current in the primary coil? You know, when you are solving problems involving a transformer, we know very well that um, the, let me remove, remove this diagram so I can use this space to solve this question. The number of turns on the secondary coil divided by number of turns on the primary coil is equal to the EMF, okay, is equal to the EMF or the voltage produced at the secondary coil divided by voltage produced at the, at the primary coil. Also, number of turns on the secondary coil divided by number of turns on the primary coil is equal to current in the primary, okay, now we are using current in primary divided by current in the secondary. Okay, take note of the position. Here we have Vs over Vp, but here we have Ip over Is. Now let us leave the variable, list out the variables we have. We have, um, what do we have here? We have number of turns in the primary, number of turns in the primary to be 5,500. Number of turns in the secondary is 500. You know, this is a step down transformer because number of turns in the secondary is smaller than number of turns in the primary. Okay, yeah, so what else do we have? We have the output of the secondary coil. So we have voltage of the secondary is 110 volts. Um, how do you get the current in the secondary here? We know very well that power is equal to current times time, right? Good. So power in the secondary is equal to current in the secondary times, sorry, power is current times voltage. P is equal to IV, current times voltage. So power in the secondary is equal to current in the secondary times voltage in the secondary coil. Yeah. So what's the power in the secondary? It says that the heater produces a 132 volts. The transformer The output of the secondary coil is 110 volts AC and it's connected to a heater. So the output is at the secondary coil of the transformer. This is the circuit symbol of the transformer, okay? So this is the output. This side is the output. And this is at the secondary coil. This is the primary where the input is, okay? So if the output is connected to a heater, then it means the secondary coil is connected to a heater. So the voltage here is considered the voltage at the secondary coil. So this is the voltage at the secondary coil. We don't have the current at the secondary coil, okay? But we have that, we don't have this current at the secondary coil, but we have that the power at the secondary coil is 132 because the heater produces power of 132 watts. So the power at the secondary side is 132 watts. How do you not get the current at the secondary coil? If you solve this expression here, you need to get the current at the secondary coil. You know, 132 is current at the secondary coil multiplied by 110. To get the current at the secondary coil, divide both sides by 110, okay? So current at the secondary coil is 132 divided by 110. 
we have the current at the secondary coil as um, let's do that 132 divided by 110 132 divided by 110 that gives us 1.2 so the current at the secondary coil is 1.2 amperes now we are going to use this formula to solve the question okay yeah that's the formula we are using let's use it what's the number of turns at the secondary coil we have 5,500, so we have 5,500 over number of turns at the primary coil. How many turns do you have at the primary coil? Sorry, number of turns at the secondary coil is 500. NS is 500. 500. Number of turns at the primary coil is 5,500, so we have 5,500 must be equal to, let me write this. 500 over 5,500 is equal to what's current at the primary coil? We don't know that. That's what the question requests for. What is the current in the primary coil? So we don't know the current in the primary coil. Divided by what's current in the secondary coil? We have the current at the secondary coil as 1.2 amperes. Divided by 1.2. If you solve this question, you get the current at the secondary coil. How do you solve this question? We have current at the primary coil is equal to 5,000 is equal to 500 multiplied by 1.2 divided by 5,500. Okay, if you do, you change the subject of this expression. Okay, we make this one the subject IP. I multiply this two and divide by 5,500. So 500 times 1.2 divided by 1,000 divided by 5,500. 500 times 1.2 divided by 5,000. 500. This will give us 0 0.11 amperes. 0 0.11 amperes. 0 0.11 amperes. That makes option A the correct answer to question number 32. We go to question 33. The scattering of alpha particles from a thin gold foil produces the following observation. A. Most of the alpha particles pass through the foil. That's correct. Most of the alpha particles are virtually undeflected. That's correct. A small fraction of alpha particles are deflected through large angles. That's also correct. A very small fraction of alpha particles bounce back from the foil. Okay, very small bounces back. That's correct. Which conclusion does not follow from this observation? Most of the mass of the gold atom is in its nucleus. That is correct. Most of the atom is empty space. That's correct. The nucleus consists of protons and neutrons. That's correct, but this expression cannot lead us to the conclusion that the nucleus consists of protons and neutrons. Though we know that the nu nucleus is heavy, is massive, and is possibly charged. The nucleus must be charged. Yes, that is also correct. Nucleus is possibly charged. We got it from that. But this is not enough to conclude that the nucleus consists of protons and neutrons, okay? We only, from this experiment, we only know that the nucleus is heavy, okay? It is positively charged, and most of the space in the atom is empty, okay? So this is a simulation of this experiment, okay? This is the nucleus. Most of the space is empty, okay? These are the electrons. Alpha particle can easily pass through where the electrons are. But when it gets close to a nucleus, it will be deflected. It gives the nucleus some space. Okay, so that is this is experiment Rutherford performed, and it it made us conclude that the nucleus is possibly charged. The nucleus is heavy because any particle that collides, alpha particles that collide with the nucleus bounce back. Okay, so since alpha particles are possibly charged, the nucleus is possibly charged, and there was repulsion between these two. Sorry, since alpha particle is possibly charged. And there was repulsion. Alpha particle is possibly charged, and there was repulsion between the alpha particle and the nucleus. They concluded that the nucleus must also be positively charged. It must have positive charges. Okay, that was all we concluded. Okay, yeah. And since some particle that collided with the nucleus bounced back, then we concluded that the nucleus must be very heavy. Okay. Hence, in addition to having protons, it also have has other heavy particles, which we refer to as the neutrons, okay? But we did not get the name of those particles from the experiment. We did not conclude that 
it has protons and neutrons. No, we just concluded that it is heavy, it is positively charged, and most of the atom is filled with empty space, okay, except the nucleus, okay, that is uh, massive. Question 35. A nuclide of chlorine has a symbol. This is a symbol. What is the nuclear number of this nuclide of chlorine? This is the nuclear number. Okay, nuclear number is mass number, and that is 35. Yeah, that makes it the correct answer to question 34. Question 35. Which change is occurring in a nucleus in a nucleus during beta emission? During beta emission, a, nu a neutron is converted into a proton proton the charge on the proton is one and an electron is emitted emitted has, emit, electron has a charge of minus one and a mass of zero a neutron a neutron has a charge of zero and a mass of one okay so the denominator here should be zero let me check So a neutron has a charge of zero. Here will be zero. Good. So a neutron will be converted into a proton and an electron. This electron is the beta particle that is emitted. Okay. So when beta particle, when the electron is emitted as a beta particle, there will be a resultant uh, proton that will be left behind. A, a neutron becomes one proton and one electron. That is correct. And it's that electron that gets emitted as the beta particle. Number 36. The graph shows how the count rate registered by a counter near to a sample of a radioactive isotope changes over a period of few days. The background count rate is five counts per minute. This is a very important variable in this question. What is the half-life of the isotope? Half-life is the time taken for half the number of elements initially present to decay, or, or the time taken for the count rate to be divided by two, okay? Count rate initially was 45. Take note that background radiation counts for five, okay? So the actual count rate, the actual count rate will be 45 minus five. How did I get 45? In the beginning, we had 45. This is the beginning, okay? But this was with background radiation. So if you remove the background radiation, remove 5 from it, we have our actual count rate at the beginning would be 40 count per day. Yeah, 40 count per day. Now, the request for half-life. What's the count time taken for this to be half? Half of this, if we divide 40 by 2, we have 20. So what is the time taken for the count rate to become 20 counts per day? 20 counts per day. But do not forget that the equipment you are using to take this measurement will also pick background noise. Yeah, the equipment will also pick background noise. So we have to add background noise to this. That will be 25. This is what the equipment will count, count per day. This is what the equipment will pick, okay? 20 counts per day due to the radioactive isotope. This five will be due to background noise, okay? Even after all the particles have decayed, there will always be a count of five counts per day, okay? When this completely decays completely, there will always be that five counts per day, okay? Background noise will always be present, okay? That's why we always consider, that's why we consider background noise in the beginning and we also factoring in background noise when we are getting our final answer so we check the time taken for us to have 25 counts per day this 20 this 25 counts per day what's the time taken for us to have 25 counts per day that is two days two days a is the correct answer to question 36 we go straight to question 37 which rule about the orbit of earth and the moon is correct approximate time for the earth to orbit the sun this is five days. These two are correct. This is time taken for the Earth to orbit the Sun. Approximate time for the Moon to orbit the Earth. The Moon orbits the Earth in approximately one month, approximately 30 days. So these two are correct. Okay, but this is where we have two correct answers. That means option D, the correct answer. Okay. 
It takes 30 days for the moon to orbit the Earth. And it takes 365 days for the Earth to orbit the Sun. Question 38. Which statement about the orbit of comets is correct? Comets have elliptical orbits and the Sun is at the center. The Sun is not at the center. Fine, they have elliptical orbits. The Sun is not at the center. Comets have elliptical orbits, correct? And the Sun is not at the center. This is correct. Comets have elliptical orbits, okay? This is the center, but the Sun is not at the center. The Sun can be at a point like this. Not at the center of the elliptical orbit, okay? Yeah, that's why they travel faster when they are closer to the sun. And they travel slowly when they are far away from the sun, okay? That's what, that's what the orbit of comets looks like, okay? They accelerate and they start decelerating, traveling slowly, okay? And if you, as they are going, moving closer to the orbit of the sun, they accelerate and then they start decelerating and they travel slowly at the extreme edge, far away from the sun. So that is what the orbit of comets looks like, okay, as the orbits in elliptical orbits around the sun. We go straight to question number 39. Which will describe the power source of a stable star? A stable star, it is nuclear fission, okay? Nuclear fusion, nuclear fusion, that's the that's what generates um, power in a stable star, nuclear fusion. And in that process, aha, we have hydrogen. That's the fusion of hydrogen atoms, okay? Two hydrogen fused together to form helium. That's the nuclear fusion. That makes option C the correct answer to question number 20, 39. Question 40. Which quantity can be determined using the brightness of a supernova? Which quantity can be determined using the brightness of a supernova? Okay, supernova, they all, they all consider to have um, the same brightness, okay? And um, if it is not appearing to be bright, then it means that, that, um, it means that, that star is far away from you. Yeah. It means that star is far away from you. Okay, that galaxy, rather, is far away from you. In a distant galaxy, yeah, it means that galaxy is far away from you. So the speed at which the galaxy is moving away from the Earth, no, 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 no. That is um, that's how you, when you use Hubble's distance, okay? When you use Hubble's distance, it is a Hubble's constant rather we use to get the distance, okay? There's a measure of distance. Distance, it is Hubble's uh, constant we use to get the speed at which the galaxy is moving away from your, us. But if we talk about the distance, yes. The brightness determines the distance because um, when you are closer to the galaxy, the galaxy appears bright. But when you are far away from the galaxy, it appears dim. Just like um, you being close to a source of light and you being extremely far away from the source of light. Okay? Yeah. Every um, supernova, they are all considered to have the same brightness as long as it is a supernova. It has, they all have the same brightness. So when you are close to it, it appears very bright. When you are extremely far away from it, it appears to be dim. Okay, so which quantity can be determined using the brightness of a supernova? Is the distance, the distance from the supernova, okay, or the distance from the galaxy? So the distance of the galaxy from the Earth, yes. It is the distance of the galaxy from the Earth. The age of the universe, we use Hubble's constant for that. Hubble constant, we, I think we use that to get the speed, the receding speed of a galaxy from the Earth. That's what we use Hubble's constant for. Okay, this brings us to the end of this paper. Thank you for watching. Ensure you subscribe to this channel. And um, this should be the last video I'm uploading this year. We'll come back in January to watch more videos. Thank you for joining us today. Do have a nice day. Goodbye.